Hello everyone! Today we are going to have science class with Teacher Eddie online! Well, today we are going to start a new chapter in science. We are now in chapter 7 and we are going to study about Earth Science. And if you're ready, why don't you take out your Earth Science Worksheet? If you don't have this, I'm going to give you one on Monday. So for now, write it down on your science notebooks. Let's start off with the three layers of the Earth. We are going to study its structure and composition, also the slow processes that change the surface of the Earth. A huge mass traveling through space that orbits the Sun. But what is the layer of Earth you are on right now called? And do you know what all the layers that form our planet are called? Earth has distinctive layers within it. Let's start with the outermost and thinnest layer, the crust. There are two parts to the crust, one being the oceanic crust, which the ocean sits on and is around 5 to 8 kilometers deep. It is mainly made of basalt, which is a type of igneous or volcanic rock. The other part is the continental crust, which is what we live on. This varies from around 8 kilometers to 70 kilometers and is largely made of another igneous rock called granite. The next layer is the mantle, mainly composed of silicate rock and minerals. The mantle is about 2,900 kilometers thick, which makes it the thickest layer of Earth, also making up 85% of the Earth's total weight. This again can be split into two distinct layers, the upper and lower mantle. The outer part of the upper mantle is like the crust, but much cooler and rigid. The crust and outer upper mantle together is called the lithosphere. The lithosphere is broken into large pieces, which make up Earth's tectonic plates. These plates sit on the inner part of the upper mantle called the asthenosphere. The rock here is softer and partially molten as temperatures rise to 3000 degrees Celsius. The lower mantle is just as hot as the upper, the rocks being hot enough to melt but remain solid due to the pressure being pushed down on it. The lower mantle is slowly moving due to convection currents, which is when deeper, hotter material rises, then cools and sinks again. This is what is thought to move the Earth's tectonic plates, shaping Earth's continents as we know them today. The outer core is the layer surrounding the inner core. It is approximately 2,400 kilometers thick, mostly made up of liquid iron and nickel at a temperature between 4,000 to 6,000 degrees Celsius. The flow of the liquid here is what creates Earth's magnetic field. 
The inner core is the hottest part of the Earth, with temperatures between 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Celsius. That is as hot as the surface of the Sun. It is roughly 1,400 kilometers thick and is also primarily iron and nickel. The air pressure here is 3 million times that of sea level, which causes the core to become solid metal. The deepest humans have ever explored is the Kola Super Deep Borehole, which was a Soviet Union scientific drilling project between 1970 and 1994 that drilled a mere 9 inch wide hole 12 kilometers deep into the Earth. One of the most exciting findings was that of microscopic fossils found in rocks nearly seven kilometers deep that were two billion years old. Very little research has been done about the layers below our feet. Just imagine what else might be down there. We would love to know your thoughts on this subject and the video as a whole, so please leave a comment below. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We really appreciate your support in helping the channel grow. The Earth is divided into different layers, just like this cake. Each layer has its own properties and is composed of different materials. Many scientists believe that as the Earth cooled, the heavier materials sank to the center and the lighter materials rose to the top. To better understand this, let's start our journey inside the Earth. Let's go! Hmm, okay. First, let's start with the part of the Earth that we live on, the outermost layer called the crust. The crust must be solid, or we'd sink into the Earth's insides. It is made up of rock and loose material. This layer is very thin in comparison to the other layers. The crust is about five miles deep beneath the oceans, and about 25 miles thick below the continents. The temperatures of the crust vary from air temperature on the top to about 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit in the deepest parts of the crust. Let's start digging. What is this place? This is the largest layer of the Earth, the mantle. The mantle is 1,800 miles thick. But before we talk about the mantle, we're going to look at two special parts of this layer that, together with the crust, have unique mechanical properties. The topmost layer is the lithosphere which is a rigid layer made up of the crust and the upper layer of the mantle. It's typically about 60 miles thick. We can imagine the crust as the shell of the Earth. Actually, we can compare the Earth with a hard-boiled egg and the lithosphere with its shell. The shell thickness divided by the radius of the egg gives a percentage of 2%. On the other side, the thickness of the lithosphere divided by the Earth radius works out to about 2% too. So the shell is to the egg what the lithosphere is to the Earth. The lithosphere essentially floats atop a semi-liquid layer known as the asthenosphere, which is about 60 miles thick. The material of which the asthenosphere is composed can be described as plastic-like. This allows the solid lithosphere to move around on top of the much weaker asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is a solid, but it is very hot with properties similar to silly putty. Now that you know about these particular layers, let's get back to the mantle, though the name's not as fun as the other ones. The mantle is made of superheated rock. The temperature of the mantle varies from 1600 degrees Fahrenheit at the top to about 7900 degrees Fahrenheit near the bottom. Due to these great temperature differences from the bottom to the top, Heat currents are generated that carry heat from the hot inner mantle to the cooler outer mantle, causing movements inside the Earth. Okay, now we're ready to learn about another main layer, the outer core. The outer core is a 1400 mile thick liquid layer. It's mostly made of iron, so it's really heavy. The temperatures here range from 7,900 degrees Fahrenheit in the outer regions to 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit near the inner core. Without the outer core, life on Earth would be very different. The movement of liquid metals in the outer core creates the Earth's magnetic field, which allows us to use a compass. And here we are in the center of the Earth, 
the inner core. The inner core is a solid layer with a thickness of 780 miles. It's made of solid iron and nickel. Oh my gosh, it is really hot down here. The inner core may have a temperature of up to 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun. Many scientists believe it is kept in the solid state because of the extreme pressure from the other layers. Wait a minute, I'm pretty sure nobody else has come down here, so how do we know so much about the Earth's layers? Oh, the answer is actually quite simple. It's true we cannot study the Earth using our eyes, but we can use other senses. The most important thing we use to sense the Earth's insides are seismic waves, that are waves of energy caused either by earthquakes or by massive man-made explosions. Timing and strength of seismic waves gives us a picture of the interior of the Earth. Seismic waves gradually bend and change speed as the density of rock changes. Another way to see the inside of the Earth is based on the analysis of rock material brought to the surface from greater depths by volcanic activity. These samples can give hints about the properties of the interior regions. Awesome! There's so much going on beneath your feet and you don't even realize it. I mean, first we started with the crust, then the mantle, then the outer core, and the inner core. Each of these layers is so different. They have different behaviors, different compositions, and don't even forget about the lithosphere and the athenosphere. But it really is getting hot down here, so I think I'm going to go back to the surface. way to describe it is weathering breaks it, erosion takes it, and deposition drops it. So if we have this boulder up here on the top of the hill, and let's say that it starts to rain on it, and maybe there's some cracks in the boulder, and slowly some of that rain water gets into some of those cracks in there, and it freezes, uh, and as water freezes it expands, we call that ice wedging, and eventually because of that ice wedging, the rock starts to break and fall into different pieces, and this piece breaks free. And this piece breaks free. And so we've weathered this apart. We, weathering has broken this rock apart. Now this rain is going to be running down the hill. All right? And so if it's running fast enough, it's going to take some of these rocks with it. All right? And so the faster that water is moving, the more it can take and the faster it can take it. So erosion moves this rock. Now it's going to keep moving as long as the water is moving fast enough. Obviously the smaller particles can go further. It takes a lot of water to move a big particle, but if this was a small particle, then it can move uh, with just a little bit of water. And eventually it gets down here, and as soon as the water slows, like when it enters a big body of water, it's going to deposit or drop it, and so it falls down here. So let's take a look at how that might happen in a couple of different situations. Um, one situation, you have water going down a river. And if you look at the river, you can see that the water is going to come down fast and it's going to bang into this side. And over here, it's going to be weathering and, and tearing away this curb. And you're going to have weathering and erosion. So it's going to weather it here and erode it and it's going to take it away. And it comes over here and it bangs in here. So on these far sides of the curb, you have weathering and then erosion as it takes it away. Now the opposite is happening on the inside of that curb. Right? So right in here you can see that it's going slower. It's going fast over here. It's moving relatively slow around the inside and so it's depositing it which is what's going to happen is these rivers are going to start getting wider and wider and wider and wider. So you can tell an old river because it meanders. So here's a picture of an actual um, example down here. You can see the outside is where the water is moving the fastest and you're having weathering. On the inside of the curb, you're having deposition. All right, if we look at the Mississippi River, so you can see the Mississippi River is coming along down through here. All right, and it's gotten all of the sediment. It's, it's eroded 
an awful lot of this farmland, so it's got a lot of sediment as it's moving down here. Eventually, when it hits the Gulf of Mexico, the water's going to slow down. So as it slows down, what are we going to have? Deposition. You can see all of this sand being deposited at the end of the Mississippi River. We call this a delta. So when the sand and sediment is being deposited at the end of the river, we call this a delta. This is a very important um, ecological area. It's where we get all of our great food, the shrimp and the crawfish that, that we all love, it comes from this really nutrient-rich area. Okay, so a delta is at the end of a long river because it slows and then you have deposition. The l smaller the particle, the further out it might go and still be deposited out here. The bigger sediments are going to be dropping out right close to the end of the river. All right, there's a two, couple different ways we might have erosion. All right, we can have erosion um, the, uh, due to uh, water. So here in this situation, you can see that we have water erosion. The waves crashing along this beach have eroded these rocks here. This is the Grand Canyon. Uh, the Grand Canyon is 5,000 feet deep and it was all cut from this Colorado River at the bottom as it's moving down through the sandstone. Okay, so erosion may happen because of water. Erosion may also happen because of wind. This sandstone, the wind has come across and it picks up the little, little specks, little tiny bits of sand, and as the wind is whipping around, it would smack them into this rocks, and one by one, bit by bit, it would slowly erode this. So you find an awful lot of this in Arizona in the southwest. Well, if you still cannot remember weathering, erosion, and deposition, let me help you. Let's make it easy. Let's try this chant. Check it out. means break or breaking. Erosion in one word means moving, while deposition in one word means dropping. Now let's put those three words together. Break, move, drop. Again, break, move, drop. Now, Copy my action and follow after me. Break, move, drop. Break, move, drop. All of these processes happen to a rock. Break, move, drop. Weathering breaks it, erosion takes it, and when the motion stops, that position drops. Break, move, drop. Break, move, drop. Wind and water moving around. Gravity pulls it down. Break, move, drop. Break, move, drop. Easy, right? Awesome! Good job, everyone! Okay, time for some activities! For our activity today, we are going to have Kahoot Challenge. And if you're in the top five of our student leaderboards, I will give you a prize on Tuesday. So, take your phones or open a new tab on your computers and go to Kahoot.it with this pin. best man or woman win, see you on Tuesday and bring your worksheets. Also don't forget to write down your name and your number on the comment section below. I'll see you on Tuesday everyone, goodbye!